Are we ready for the second half of chapter 21? As we continue to read in Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I am Miss Erin here at the Caribou Public Library. Thanks for joining us today for our chapter book story time. All right, so they had discovered that Laurie had written some mischievous letters, right? <laughs> and had a <coughs> prank on Meg. So he had apologized and now left. And this is right after he leaves the room. As soon as he had gone, she wished, Joe wished, that she had been more forgiving. And when Meg and her mother went upstairs, she felt lonely and longed for Teddy. After resisting for some time, she yielded to the impulse and, armed with a book to return, went over to the big house. Is Mr. Lawrence in? asked Joe of a housemaid who was coming downstairs. Yes, miss, but I don't believe he's seeable just yet. Why not? Is he ill? Oh, la, no, miss, but he's had a scene with Mr. Lorry, who is in one of his tantrums about something, which vexes the old gentleman, and so I didn't go nigh him. Where is Lorry? Shut up in his room, and he won't answer, though I've been a-tapping. I don't know what's to become of the dinner, for it's ready, and there's no one to eat it. I'll go and see what the matter is. I'm not afraid of either of them. Up went Joe, and knocked smartly on the door of Lorry's little study. Stop that, or I'll open the door and make you, called out the young gentleman in a threatening tone. Joe immediately pounded again. The door flew open, and in she bounced, before Laurie could recover from his surprise. Seeing that he really was out of temper, Joe, who knew how to manage him, assumed a contrite expression, and going artistically down upon her knees, said meekly, Please forgive me for being so cross. I came to make it up, and I can't go away until I have. It's all right, get up, and don't be a goose, Joe, was the cavalier reply to her petition. Thank you, I will. Could I ask what's the matter? You don't look exactly easy in your mind. I've been shaken, and I won't bear it, growled Laurie indignantly. Who did it? demanded Joe. Grandfather, if it had been anyone else, I'd have... And the injured young youth finished his sentence by an energetic gesture of the right arm. <laughs> That's nothing. I often shake you, and you don't mind, said Joe soothingly. Pooh, you're a girl, and it's fun, but I'll allow no man to shake me. I don't think anyone would care to try it, if you looked as much like a thundercloud as you do now. Why were you treated so? Just because I wouldn't say what your mother wanted me for. I'd promised not to tell, and of course I wasn't going to break my word. Couldn't you satisfy your grandpa in any other way? No, he would have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I've had told my part of the scrape, and if I could, without bringing Meg in, as I couldn't, I held my tongue and bore the scolding till the old gentleman collared me. Then I got angry and bolted for fear I should forget myself. It wasn't nice, but he's sorry, I know, so go down and make up. I'll help you. Hanged if I do. I'm not going to be lectured and pummeled by everyone, just for a bit of frolic. I was sorry about Meg, and begged pardon like a man, but I won't do it again, when I wasn't in the wrong. He didn't know that. He ought to trust me and not act as if I was a baby. It's no use, Joe. He's got to learn that I'm able to take care of myself, and I don't need anyone's apron string to hold on by. What pepper pots you are, sighed Joe. How do you mean to settle this affair? Well, he ought to beg pardon, and believe me when I say I can't tell him when the rose what the row's about. Bless you, he won't do that. I won't go down until he does. Now, Teddy, be sensible. Let it pass, and I'll explain what I can. You can't stay here, so what's the use of being melodramatic? I don't intend to stay here long, anyway. I'll slip off and take a journey somewhere. When Grandpa misses me, he'll come round fast enough. I dare say, but you ought not to go and worry him. Don't preach. I'll go to Washington and see Brooke. It's gay there. I'll enjoy myself at the troubles, after the troubles. What fun you'd have. I wish I could run off too, said Joe, forgetting her part of mentor in lively visions of marital life at the Capitol. Come on then. Why not? You go and surprise your father and I'll stir up old Brooke. It would be a glorious joke. Let's do it, Joe. We'll leave a letter saying we're all right and trot off at once. I've got money enough. It'll do you good and be no harm and you could go to your father. 
for a moment. Jo looked as if she would agree, for, wild as the plan was, it just suited her. She was tired of care and confinement, longed for change, and thoughts of her father blended temptingly with the novel charms of camps and hospitals, liberty and fun. Her eyes kindled as they turned wistfully toward the window, but they fell on the old house opposite, and she shook her head with sorrowful decision. If I was a boy, we'd run away together and have a capital time, but I'm a miserable girl, and I must be proper and stop at home. Don't tempt me, Teddy. It's a crazy plan. That's the fun of it, began Laurie, who had got a willful fit on him and was possessed to break out of bounds in some way. Hold your tongue, cried Joe, covering her ears. Prunes and prisms are my doom, and I may as well make up my mind to it. I came here to moralize, not to hear about things that make me skip to think of. I knew Meg would wet blanket such a proposal, but I thought you had more spirit, began Laurie, insinuatingly. Bad boy, be quiet. Sit down and think of your own sins. Don't go making me add to mine. If I get your grandpa to apologize for the shaking, will you give up running away? asked Joe seriously. Yes, but you won't do it, answered Laurie, who wished to make up, but felt that his outraged dignity must be appeased first. If I can manage the young one, I can the old one, muttered Joe as she walked away, leaving Laurie bent over a railroad map with his head propped up on both hands. Come in, and Mr. Lawrence's gruff voice sounded gruffer than ever as Joe tapped at his door. It's only me, sir, come to return a book, she said blandly as she entered. Want any more? asked the old gentleman, looking grim and vexed, but trying not to show it. Yes, please. I like old Sam so well. I think I'll try the second volume, returned Joe, hoping to propitiate him by accepting a second dose of Boswell's Johnson, as he had recommended that lively work. The shaggy eyebrows unbent a little as he rolled the steps toward the shelf where the Johnsonian literature was placed. Joe skipped up and, sitting on the top step, affected to be searching for her book but was really wondering how best to introduce the dangerous object of her visit. Mr. Lawrence seemed to suspect that something was brewing in her mind, for, after taking several brisk turns about the room, he faced round on her, speaking so abruptly that Rasselas tumbled, down, <laughs> tumbled face downward on the floor. What has that boy been about? Don't try to shield him now. I know he's been in mischief by the way he acted when he came home. I can't get a word from him, and when I threatened to shake the truth out of him, he bolted upstairs and locked himself into his room. He did wrong, and we forgave him, and all promised not to say a word to anyone, began Joe reluctantly. That won't do. He shall not shelter himself behind a promise from you, soft-hearted girls. If he's done anything amiss, he shall confess, beg pardon, and be punished. Out with it, Joe. I won't be kept in the dark. Mr. Lawrence looked so alarming and spoke so sharply that Jo would have gladly run away if she could, but she was perched aloft on the steps, and he stood at the foot, a lion in the path, so she had to stay and brave it out. Indeed, sir, I cannot tell. Mother forbid it. Laurie has confessed, asked pardon, and been punished quite enough. We don't keep silence to shield him, but to shield someone else and it will make more trouble if you interfere. Please don't. It was partly my fault, but it's all right now. So let's forget it and talk about the Rambler or something pleasant. Hang the Rambler, came down, and come down and give me your word that this harem scarum boy of mine hasn't done anything ungrateful or impertinent. If he has, after all your kindness to him, I'll thrash him with my own hands. The threat sounded awful, but did not alarm Joe, for she knew the irascible old man would never lift a finger against his grandson, whatever he might say to the contrary. She obediently descended, made as light of the prank as she could without betraying Meg, or forgetting the truth. Hmph. Ha. Well, hmph. If the boy held his tongue because he'd promised, and not from obstinacy, I'll forgive him. He's a stubborn fellow, and hard to manage, said Mr. Lawrence, rubbing up his hair until it looked as if he'd been out in a gale and smoothing the frown from his brow with an air of relief. "'So am I, but a kind word will govern me when all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't,' said Joe, trying to say a kind word for her friend, 
who seemed to get out of one scrape only to fall into another. "'You think I'm not kind to him, eh?' was the sharp answer. "'Oh, dear, no, sir. You are rather too kind sometimes, and then just a trifle hasty when he tries your patience. Don't you think you are?' Joe was determined to have it out now, and tried to look quite placid, though she quaked a little after her bold speech. To her great relief and surprise, the old gentleman only threw his spectacles on to the table with a rattle, and exclaimed, quite frankly, "'You're right, girl, I am. I love the boy, but he tries my patience past bearing, and I don't know how it will end, if we go on so. "'Well, I'll tell you. He'll run away.' Joe was sorry for that speech the minute it was made. She meant to warn him that Laurie would not bear much restraint, and hoped that he would be more forbearing with the lad." Mr. Lawrence's ruddy face changed suddenly, and he sat down with a troubled glance at the picture of a handsome man, which hung over his table. It was Laurie's father, who had run away in his youth, and married against the imperious old man's will. Joe fancied he remembered and regretted the past, and she wished that she had held her tongue. He won't do it unless he is very much worried and only threatens it sometimes, when he gets tired of studying. I often think he should like to, especially since my hair was cut. So, if you ever miss us, you may advertise for two boys and look among the ships bound for India." She laughed as she spoke, and Mr. Lawrence looked relieved, evidently taking the whole as a joke. "'You hussy, how dare you talk in that way? Where's your respect for me and your proper bringing up? Bless the boys and girls, what torments they are, yet we can't do without them,' he said, pinching her cheeks good-naturedly. Go and bring that boy down to his dinner, tell him it's all right, and adver advise him not to put on tragedy airs with his grandfather. I won't bear it. He won't come, sir. He feels badly because you didn't believe him when he said he couldn't tell. I think the shaking hurt his feelings very much. Joe tried to look pathetic, but must have failed, for Mr. Lawrence began to laugh, and she knew the day was won. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, and ought to thank him for not shaking me, I suppose. What the dickens does the fellow expect? And the old gentleman looked a trifle ashamed of his own testiness. If I was you, I'd write him an apology, sir. He says he won't come down until he has one, and talks about Washington, and goes on in an absurd way. A formal apology will make him see how foolish he is, and bring him down quite amiable. Try it. He likes fun, and this way is better than talking. I'll carry it up and teach him his duty. Mr. Lawrence gave her a sharp look, and put on his spectacles, saying slowly, "'You're a sly puss, but I don't mind being managed by you and Beth. Here, give me a bit of paper, and let us have done with this nonsense.' The note was written in the terms which one gentleman would use to another, after offering some deep insult. Joe dropped a kiss on the top of Mr. Lawrence's bald head, and ran up to slip the apology under Laurie's door, advising him through the keyhole to be submissive, decorous, and a few other agreeable impossibilities. Finding the door locked again, she left the note to do its work, and was going quietly away, when the young gentleman slid down the banisters and waited for her at the bottom, saying, with his most virtuous expression of countenance, "'What a good fellow you are, Joe! Did you get blown up?' he added, laughing. "'No, he was pretty clever on the whole.' "'Ah, I got it all around. Even you cast me off over there, and I felt just ready to go to the deuce.' he began apologetically. Don't talk in that way. Turn over a new leaf and begin again, Teddy, my son. I keep turning over new leaves and spoiling them, as I used to spoil my copy books, and I make, and I make so many beginnings there will never be an end, he said dolefully. Go and eat your dinner. You'll feel better after it. Men always croak when they're hungry. And Joe whisked out at the front door after that. That's a label on my sect, answered Laurie, quoting Amy as she went to partake of humble pie dutifully with his grandfather, who was quite saintly in temper and overwhelmingly respectful in manner all the rest of the day. Everyone thought the manner ended, the matter ended, and the little cloud blown over, but the mischief was done, for, though others forgot it, Meg remembered. She never alluded to a certain person, but she thought of him a good deal dreamed dreams more than ever, and once, Joe, rummaging her sister's desk for stamps, found a bit of paper scribbled over with the words, 
Mrs. John Brooke. Whereat, she groaned tragically and cast it into the fire, feeling that Laurie's prank had hastened the evil day for her. And that is the end of chapter 21. Thanks for joining us again, and we will see you next time. Bye for now.